Education, what they do and why it's important today. This event is co-hosted by Karam House and Israeli Politics Simplified. Karam House is a community-focused organization based in Tel Aviv. Karam House has run 226 events prior to COVID for Israelis and internationals alike. Now with the easing of restrictions, you can expect more in-person events from Karam House. Check out their events page for more information. Israeli Politics Simplified is a Facebook page dedicated to bringing Anglos in Israel unbiased, easy to understand information about Israeli politics. I'm Meira Lerner, creator of the Israeli Politics Simplified page, and I will be your host tonight. Over the past few months, Karam House and Israeli Politics Simplified have worked together to produce our virtual event series titled Polytalks, meant to inform and empower English speakers to make informed decisions that can impact their lives in Israel. During the lead up to the recent Israeli election, we interviewed candidates from parties across the spectrum, as well as having analysis events. We are proud to say that the series has amassed over 12,000 views between our different stream talks. Moving forward, we hope and plan to bring you more valuable content and continue the Polytalk series with more interviews with Knesset members and analysts and commentary on current events in Israeli politics. Tonight though, Karam House and Israeli Politics Simplified are starting a new initiative, interesting talks that bring value not directly connected to politics. Stay posted as you can expect more of these as well as our political content starting with our discussion tonight to learn more about the role of the World Zionist Organization in this day and age. Over the past two weeks, Israel has observed a string of national days of celebration and remembrance. Starting with Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and moving to Yom HaZikaron, National Memorial Day for Soldiers and Victims of Terror, and most recently, Yom HaAtzmaut, Israel's Independence Day. While politics has a tendency to divide us, these national holidays do the opposite. They bring us together and unite us all as one. In honor of these special days, and particularly Yom HaAtzmaut, we've decided to take a short pause from discussing politics in Israel and focus on Israel itself. To help us with that, we are very pleased to be joined tonight by Mr. Rafael Cohen, Director of Mount Herzl and Foreign Relations for the World Zionist Organization. Rafael Cohen has dedicated his life to Israel and advancing Zionist initiatives, first as the Shaliach in Australia and upon his return to Israel as CEO of a youth movement in Israel and then CEO of an organization focused on strengthening ties between Israel and diaspora Jewry. From there, he moved on to become the director of the Jewish agency's operations on the east coast of North America, overseeing around 80 shlichim in the region and facilitating the aliyah of over 6,000 olim from the area. Since 2015, Rafael has worked directly for the World Zionist Organization, first as the director for Israel operations of the Department for Combating Anti-Semitism, and now as the director of Har Herzl and Foreign Relations for the WZO. With that, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Rafael Cohen. Rafael, thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure, Mira. I'm very happy to be here. So I want to just start out by asking you quite simply, what is the World Zionist Organization? I know that you have a video to start us off, so we can start there. I would love to start with a short video, which will emphasize a little bit of what is the World Zionist Organization. Great. So you can share your screen. And Rafael, we don't hear the sound. You want me to repeat? Yeah, can we can we share the screen again with the sound? Uh, let's do that here. Great. There we go. בבאזל ייסדתי את מדינת היהודים.
и Мединат Исраэл. That was a bit of a, a little bit about what we are doing in the World Zionist Organization. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to go work every day. I'm excited to go to work every day uh, because uh, we're dealing with Zionism. Um, you know, a little bit to let you know, um, 120 years ago, actually in 1897, there was a guy that I'm assuming you all heard his name, Theodor Herzl. Basically, he was the first person that came and thought about that idea of a Jewish state. Something that, think about it, we're 2,000 years in the exile, and a guy coming, a secular guy, coming that uh, growing up in, uh, in West Europe, and he's coming with the idea of, of something new. And basically, his idea was to gather, think about, about it, that you're trying to persuade your friends And he's persuading 208 friends, delegates from all over the world to come, taking money from his own pocket and, and actually is able to convince them that they can come with, with a strange idea that we will have a country, a state somewhere far from, from where they're living. And basically that moment was the, the, like the known thing, the Basel Congress, the first Zionist Congress. And at that moment, There were the, the, the World Zionist Organization was established. Basically, what's happened since then was when they started that they want to fundraise, so they came and, and, they, and they create the Keren Esod. When we thought about Aliyah and about education, the Jewish agency was established. When we thought about redeeming land and purchasing the land in Israel or, or, or a, a settlements, so we, we thought about the JNF Kakad, as you all know. So a guy, that actually was born in 1840, uh, sorry, in 1880, and was actually died in the age of 44. In nine years of his life, was able to spend all his money, but to build and to create a dream. One vision, one dream. And in his, in his actually bequest, he wrote, he, because in, 2000, in 1904, he wrote that within 50 years from that day, And within 50 years, they're going to be a state that will, will, will actually will be built. And in, actually, as we know, in 47, think about it, in 1947, in, in the United Nations, in Kaftet Ben November, actually, that was a decision that the Jewish people will have a land. So for me, what, we, what I'm doing is actually I'm fulfilling the vision of Theodor Herzl, and I see him as the modern Moses that basically... <laughs> came nearly arrived to the land. He didn't reach the land. He was died in, 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 in 1904, before Israel was established. But he brought the dream to alive. And that's what, what I, I'm amazing about. So that's a little bit about that. So it's actually interesting that you're bringing up the history and, and that you mentioned that he predicted that within 50 years uh, that the modern state would be established. Um, but so if we're already talking about that, I, I am really curious to know, did the World Zionist Organization at that time have any real impact in the founding of the modern state of Israel? And if they did, what was their role in establishing that state? In, in his roles, Herzl was, uh, at the beginning, was a journalist, he was a writer, he wrote a lot. He wrote uh, uh, about a phrase called the exemplary society. Basically, in his vision, in the Altnoil book, he wrote how the society should look like. So he basically uh, thought in his, in his, his he, he cre created a very liberal uh, article about it. Uh, in his vision, I have to admit that many things that he described there, we didn't reach yet. But although all that criticism, although all the conflict that we're having in the society, Think about the exemplary society that we're having in Israel. I'm talking about the startup nation that you all know. Startup nation, that it's amazing, all the innovation that is, is in Israel. When we're facing today, unfortunately, the COVID-19, the pandemic, we see how Israel is dealing with, with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking from his vision, from history, to the, to, the, to the modern state of life. I mean, Israeli 
the democracy that you're having in Israel, the, the right for the minorities, the values that you're having in Israel, the, the, the Shalom agreements that we are reaching, the recently four uh, uh, Shalom agreements, it's, it's unbelievable. So we are having the vision, we're having the goal to reach out to that exemplary society that, that helps us spoke. But he put the infrastructure, he put the infrastructure, the, the, the rational infrastructure, for, and, and actually also how we are, where are we heading and what is the goal? Mm. Um, so if we're speaking about how the, the beginning of the World Zionist Organization as, as Herzl was working on it in terms of, of raising money and establishing this idea of what Zionism should be and what Israel should be, what would you say is, is what makes the World Zionist Organization, organization different today? What is the, the WZO's role in, in Zionism and in Israel today? The, the role of the, of, of the WZO today is, uh, is very, very, uh, like the range is very big. We're dealing with so many aspects of life and I can count some of them. We're facing so many challenges today. And I'm gonna give an example. Many of the people who live in America or living outside of Israel, doesn't aware that the, the population that most assimilated, for example, are the Israelis who are living outside of, of Israel. Um, and to give you a number that shocked me when I heard about it, we're talking about 1 million Israelis that were um, living in Israel and left in some stage of life and living in, in I'm talking about mainly North, North America. Uh, and for example, that's kind of challenge that they are usually secular. They're usually uh, not connected to any community congregation. They're not going to the synagogue. Uh, they have a Hebrew level good, them, but their kids, the second generation is the real challenge. So for example, we develop a department that dealing with the Israelis in the diaspora, dealing with connecting the Israelis for the connect for, for the for the for the nation, for the Am, the Am Israel, because we're losing them in a generation. Their parents are still coming and visiting. The kids is something different. And uh, you know, you have a variety of projects as uh, Garin Sabar and a variety of projects that they uh, Especially for kids, for Israeli kids, and that's how you connect them. Now, I'm just giving it as an example of uh, of one challenge. You're having so many examples of of, uh, of uh, challenges. So we're dealing with the uh, fighting anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, in the last decade, every year is worse than the previous year about the numbers of of the of the cases on the incidents of of uh, this anti-Semitism. We are dealing with uh, preserving the language. Less and less people in the outside of Israel speaking Hebrew. So the WZO have hundreds of ulpanim. Uh, we are talking about connecting between the Jews and building bridge between the communities outside of Israel and Israel. Uh, uh, just to give a number that will uh, uh, emphasize it, we are having, to, together with the Jewish agency, nearly 2,000 shlichim, emissaries, that going usually in the summertime and going for a year, for a second year, for third, three years, uh, some of you might know them. I'm talking about uh, teachers in schools that basically uh, nearly more than, this year we send more than 200 teachers for Jewish day schools that coming, speaking about Israel, about connection, about holidays, about Chagim, about tradition, about any connection to Israel. We're talking about campus, what you might know as Hillel Shlichim, that working in the campuses, fighting uh, the BDS, uh, creating some solidarity activities with Israel. Uh, the, the, every shlichim, there is a range of shlichim and the varieties of activities, but all of them, what's in common to all of them is that the role is to make connection between the people who are living outside Israel for the people who are living inside of Israel and to make those bridges. That's really interesting. And I definitely want to dive into some of those particular challenges that you were talking about before. But before we get too deep into the actual operations, I do want to give people more of an opportunity to understand the WZO as an organization. Um, and I know that the WZO is made up of quite a few different parts and pieces, and you actually mentioned a few of them, like Karen Ayesod and, and the Jewish Agency. Can you talk a little bit more about what that actual structure is and what all of these pieces are that make up the WZO and, and what the differences are between them? 
I have to involve, as you mentioned in my CV, I'm involved in the national institutes like in 20 years. I was a JNF Shalia, I was involved, uh, I'm in WZO, I work for the Jewish LC in two Shlichuyot, and still I have what to learn. I have to admit that it's quite complicated, but I will, I will try my best to explain. Basically, we're talking about the World Zionist Organization is, is umbrella organization. If I need to use a metaphor, the World Zionist Organization is basically the Mimshala of the Jewish people. It's a government of the Jewish people. The government, and, and even, even I'm going to give an example, uh, like something to uh, uh, emphasize that example. My boss, the chairman of the World Zionist Organization, is sitting in the office where Ben Gurion was sitting. Wow. Literally, the same, the same offices that were for the, the Ben Gurion before he was prime minister was the, uh, the chairman of the WZO office sitting there right now. So uh, we, when I'm talking about the World Zionist Organization, I'm talking about a, a, a government, a Jewish government. So I want that you will see me as your representative for the government. And when I'm using that metaphor, uh, we're having uh, ministers and we're having offices. Uh, and basically the national institutes are divided for four organizations, which one of them is World Zionist Organization, which is the umbrella organization. And underneath you have three organizations. One of them is JNF Kakal, dealing with reservoirs, recycling. Uh, today it's more about trendy, about uh, the walking and the, and the touring, et cetera, et cetera. And you have in Keren Esol, which working mainly outside of America about fundraising, basically approaching for the people to fundraise from there, from the Jewish people, for, for, the, for the Jewish people. And the, and the last one is, a, a, I mentioned WZO, I mentioned Yisrael Yitzhak, Keren Esod, and the Jewish Agency. We have all together four organizations that working for the Jewish people. Now, what is our branches or what actually, how we're reaching out for people, the World Zionist Organization. We're having nearly 40 federations, which are basically a, are a, are a, basically our people on the ground. So if I'm gonna give it America as an example, in America, we're having AZM, American Zionist Movement, which is a umbrella organization for all the Zionist organization within America. Uh, you have there some dozens of organization. Each of them have to, uh, have to uh, uh, declare that they are agree with the, Ju the Jerusalem program, which saying basically that you are a Zionist, that you are supporting Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on a practical level, they are facilitating our programs on the ground, such as the Shlichim, which is another branch I, I, before I would describe. But this is basically the, the, the organization. The organization is, is coming from top and down to the bottom with organization and with people that working to fulfill that goal of Zionism, to fulfill that goal of basically, I didn't speak about the A word, the Aliyah, <laughs> which is the, all the activity of the Jewish agency is basically is a spiral that uh, every education, every activity that you're doing with a kid in a school or with a teen in a youth movement or with an adult in the synagogue, like you're having shlichim that working in synagogues. So all of them, the idea is to strengthen your identity, to, to, bring you to, 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 to bring you up to another stage that you'll be in a better connection with Israel. Uh, you can say, okay, I'm supporting, you will know to, uh, to do advocacy for Israel, you will know to, to explain the situation in Israel, uh, you might learn Hebrew, you might visit Israel, you might contribute to Israel, but in any case, our biggest fear is the uh, unaffiliated crowd, like people that are not know what is Israel, doesn't understand what's going on. Uh, so yeah. it's, it sounds really amazing because it seems like the WZO actually has like little branches that really go across the globe. It's, That's right. it's like a massive operation, which is incredible to think about. Um, and actually, and we'll get into this more in a little bit, um, but it, it makes me think of the, the World Zionist Congress that I actually was fortunate to be a part of. And I do want to get back to that. But if we're already talking about Aliyah um, and, and connecting Jews all over the world to this idea of Israel, it really seems like a, a, that's, I guess, the main underlying goal of the WZO is just to make Israel more part of the general discourse among Jews all across the globe and have it become a part of their identity in some way. Would, would you say that that's accurate? It's quite accurate. It's quite accurate. Although it's very dynamic, it's changed with the time. We have to be, we understand that terminology change. We understand that trends are change. 
we understand. But it, it, I think that what's, what's common for all time through, from the history to now is to keep the connection of people to Israel. Uh, and I'm just going to give an example. You know, the Shlichim, uh, if uh, there was a, a chef that coming to visit New York, so I remember that we took the chef and we invited all people who like uh, to, to cook. Uh, and, and, you know, just to show people that Israel is a normal place, that you have here everything, and you have here normal people that not speaking 24-7 about the conflict, but living their life, want to grow up their kids, want to enjoy, want to go to the swimming pool, want to ride their bicycle, want to have a normal life. And our goal is to reach out because unfortunately what you hear in the media is uh, just about the conflict or just about the bad things. And you hear less about the innovation and the startup nation and about the amazing fact that Israel, how Israel dealing with the, the COVID-19 and how things are uh, very modern here. And we want to reach out formal and, not, and also informal. When you are a, a friend living near someone and you're able to go to his class, to his school, to his party, and, and to bring that message, it's much more efficient. It almost sounds like, um, like the WZO in a way does uh, like positive PR for Israel in some ways. In some way, in some way, you're right. Interesting to yeah. think about. But what you're saying about um, uh, bringing Israel into people's daily lives and creating a connection and, and having it normalized, it actually kind of reminds me of um, the Moshava camps in, uh, in North America. Many, I mean, I grew up here, but many of my friends and family, they went to Moshava and they used to tell me how a lot of the words that the camp used for things like the canteen or for their schedule and things like that were Hebrew words. And it was so built into their day and their schedule that it, it, they didn't even notice it. it almost became part of their normal lives because that's how they related to it. Um, so it, it's interesting because I feel like that's taking some of that message that you're talking about and, and really bringing it home. Now, granted, a lot of these people that go to these camps are already from religious Zionist homes and go to religious schools. And so they hear a lot about it anyway. But even on a small level, I'm sure that makes a massive impact. And I'm sure if we ask the, the managers of Moshava how many people, how many of their campers made Aliyah, that I came I no that. my I husband, no my husband is a Moshava camper and he made wow. Aliyah on his own wow. at, at 18. So there's some <laughs> impact. <laughs> um, but I do you know, actually. You know, one, one of the story I remember when I left Australia and one of my Hanichot came to me and she said to me, you know, Rafael, and that, I, I, you know, Rafael, I, I came for all camps and everything. I was a Betal Shalia. And she said, oh, so Rafael, because of what we learn in Betal, I know one thing that I'm never going to get married with someone who is not Jew. And, okay. I, and it made me so happy. I mean, I mean, that we're reaching out for people. I mean, everyone can do whatever we want with his life, his private life. And we are respecting that and everything indefinitely. But at the end of the day, you are happy that you're reaching out for people. You're touching their heart. You're touching their soul. And it's not easy. It's not easy today with all the atmosphere and everything. It's hard. It's hard to maintain your Jewishness when you're living in, uh, in Brisbane with um, a few hundred more Jewish people around you. So we're trying to make it, to make it happen. And sometimes, most of the time, it's work. So I do, I do actually want to talk a little bit more about Aliyah specifically, because it seems like that would be almost the, the central goal of the WZO would be to bring more people to Israel. So I do want to hear a little bit more about how that works from the WZO's perspective and, and what you as an organization do to encourage and facilitate Aliyah and, uh, and also hear about any assistance that you provide to Olim after they arrive here. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Um, I have to, to explain something for people to just to understand. Until 10 years ago, I think it was 2011, 2010, the Jewish Agency and the WZ were one organization. They had one chairman and one organization. And by the way, as I mentioned before, for people who listened before, is that uh, the main goal of the Jewish Agency was Aliyah. Now, because the World Zionist Organization and the WZ were splitting in 2000, I think it was 2011, uh, there was, the, basically we divided the work between us. We are working with promotion of Aliyah. The Jewish Agency is still there working with Aliyah. Me, myself, personally, I was Aliyah Shaliyah. You mentioned mm -hmm. that I had the privilege to bring 6,000 Olim to Israel. Amazing. And by the way, I always asking them in every interview, 
what was the minute that you made decision to make Aliyah? What, what's made the change? Every time they had given me the same answer. It was someone that touched me, them shaliyah, school, uh, whatever it's going to be. A uh, visit in Israel, by the way, what, what one of the most uh, meaningful thing for people, the visits itself in Israel. So we are right now dealing with uh, promoting Aliyah. We have a one department in the, within the WZO that dealing with the, we do the Aliyah. So you're having Aliyah fair, uh, you're having Aliyah fair, and you're having Ulpanim. And I'm going to give an example that every Ole that's willing to make Aliyah is eligible to get Ulpan. I don't, don't remember the exact hours as he is eligible to, but he's getting, he's eligible to learn Hebrew because we believe that if you learn Hebrew before you're coming, it's something that's very, very important. And what we realize from all our research that people have to have the language, people have to, uh, 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 and they have to find a job. Those are big, you know it as Ola Hadasha previously. This is big. Well, I, I was young. <laughs> I was yeah, you're right, but your, your parents, your parents, I mean, I'm assuming that Stephanie will tell us that uh, she faced it. <laughs> sure. uh, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to, uh, because Israel is a very warm place. People will gather you, will help you, will approach you. But at the end of the day, you have to understand the language. You have to understand the mentality, which is much more, uh, much more harder. And we are in the WZO, we are doing uh, Aliyah affairs, for example. So in the Aliyah affairs, you're getting the whole relevant information. Now, regarding to what's happening after you arrive into Israel, that's a little bit different because the mandate of working with Olim or working with Olim that arriving is basically a uh, belong to Misrada Klita. Uh, 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 and they, they are dealing, they give, they're allocating you the money and everything. Uh, I still have to say that we are doing, uh, we're initiating a lot of things in order to help the Olim. For example, a, a few months ago, we uh, uh, initiated a, a discussion in the Aliyah committee within the Knesset about all the obstacles that Olim are facing. There is a one belief, if, if some of you are hearing me, there is one belief that all the Americans are rich. There is one belief that for all the Americans is easy, but it's not right. It's not true. There are people mm -hmm. coming from America and need help and need guidance and need the direction and need orientation. And the mentality is very different in Israel and America. Uh, so, uh, and, and it doesn't make sense that someone will finish a degree in Harvard and some, mm -hmm. in some way, very strange way, we realize that you have to fulfill some things in the bar -Ilan University with all the respect to bar -Ilan University, but, uh, but it doesn't make sense. So we approach to the uh, uh, legislation in the Knesset and we are trying to change some obstacles to make the life of the, of the Olim uh, uh, easier. A lot of Olim, by the way, that I spoke with them recently said that they are so happy that they came here and they realized how many things changed. But still, as I, I said to other Olim that I dealt with thousands of them, I said to them, guys, it's not gonna be everything easy. It's, it's hard, it's tough, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we are trying, uh, not allocating a lot of money because that's not our authority, but we are trying to help them with the language, with some uh, a kind of a professional development, with orientation, uh, uh, working very closely with Nefesh Benefesh, uh, with the Mankal and with the CEO and everyone. Uh, we're trying really, really, really hard to help each of them. I promise you that no one, everyone that will come to Israel, we're gonna try to help. We cannot help everyone, but we're gonna try for sure. Um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that you work with Nefesh Benefesh. I was gonna ask if there's any cooperation there because they've kind of taken uh, the whole Aliyah enterprise, so to speak, and in just, America, you know, in, in America for sure. Um, is there is there as much? I mean, I I'm originally American, so my connection is more there, um, and I know how much work certainly Nefesh Benefesh does and other organizations do to promote Aliyah. I am curious about who kind of takes on that role in other countries, like. You're in other countries of Europe and, and South America and, and uh, South Africa, all these other countries where there, there are Jews. Um, who's kind of taking on that uh, role of, of pushing forward this idea of Aliyah in those places? Again, I, I, when you're saying uh, the role and the position and the, and the role of, for example, because uh, the, the, the case which I'm familiar more with in North America with uh, Nefesh Benefesh, so there was agreement between Nefesh Benefesh and Jewish agency, how to divide the work. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm describing it as a pipe that when Ole is coming, he have, first of all, it probably gonna hear about Aliyah probably from Nefesh Benefesh because 
the nefesh benefesh aliyah is the, of, of all the marketing. So you're gonna, you're gonna find the leaflet in the, in the synagogue, in the shul, or you're gonna hear about someone talk, but we're working so well together that also I remember in my shlichut, they were inviting me to come to speak about that or about other things. So we're working well because it's, it's, it's a good cause. And at the end of the day, it's a win-win situation for both of the organization. When you're arriving to reach to the eligibility and, and the benefits that the Ole might get, uh, you're dealing with the Jewish agency emissary. So it's working in some stage that you have to get to the pipe at the beginning with the, probably you're gonna get in with Nefesh Benefesh and then you're gonna get you're gonna get the whole services from the Jewish agency. And he even will invite you the ticket for the flight. And at the end, at the end, you're gonna finish the, the Aliyah with the Aliyah flight with Nefesh Benefesh. So it's working like it's two hands working together. In every in other places, uh, in the other place in the world, there is some local organization which are kind of rational of the of the Nefesh Benefesh, but I have to say that the numbers are different. We're talking about uh, sometimes, you know, rather than France, that you're having a big amount of olim, you don't have too many places that you have thousands of thousands. So I do know, for example, that in Australia, you're dealing like the ratio of the olim from Australia is the highest in the world, but it's very small population. So we're talking about hundreds a year. Still, it's, it's a high ratio. Uh, so there is a local organization. I don't remember, I don't remember his name, but they're helping to the olim. But at the end of the day, so all of the olim who help is, is the uh, misradim, the government in Israel. That's the main people. And by the way, why, which if someone considering Aliyah, if someone thinking about someone that know to make Aliyah, you have to be aware for your uh, uh, rights because a lot of things olim doesn't know. They doesn't know that they're eligible to get discount in the arnona, in the tax that they have to pay for the municipality in the first four or five years. Many, many things. So I, 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 in, if you want to make Aliyah, you have to be Israeli. You have to be Israel, you have to be rude a little bit to ask questions, to, to push a little bit, because if you're not, you're not going to hear about it. So that's, uh, that's the deal. That's part of the deal of, of, the, deal of Israel. <laughs> Listen, you have to completely immerse yourself. You can't stand on the sidelines. You want to be Israeli, you got to jump right in and do it. <laughs> I remember that a nice woman in Australia told me that if you are standing on the line in America, she came from England, and she said to me, I realize that if you're standing in the line in Israel, you're going backwards. So, uh, okay, I know if you are. You're doing it wrong. You can't stand on the lines. You gotta <laughs> jump over. <laughs> and don't take no for an answer. You can always get a yes. <laughs> I remember that I was teaching my Olim that even if you're coming to the bank, you have to negotiate about the rate that you're getting. You're gonna go to Bank Lumi and you're gonna negotiate. You're gonna go to Bank Discount and they might offer you something better. That's <laughs> part of the of being it's Jewish. Of and it's all here. <laughs> Um, before we move on to a different topic, I do, because you, you actually mentioned this, and I think it's interesting, um, but you mentioned that one of the things that tends to push people towards the idea of Aliyah or, or connects them more to Israel and, and this idea is a visit to Israel, um, which I think is very interesting. Now, the, the world that I grew up in, visits to Israel are very common, but it's not something that everybody necessarily has a chance to do. Now, I know that there are organizations like Birthright that do work very hard to give people the opportunity to come if they want it. Um, is that something that the WZO is working on as well in terms of facilitating trips or is that something that just happens if it happens? I, we, we, we less dealing with subsidized flights. So basically we are trying not to use our money for that, mm -hmm. but we do have a lot of delegations group that's coming. I'm going to give an example. Every year we're having uh, 50 teenagers that come in uh, from the Great Neck area, uh, and yeah, we are hosting them. And we're having dozens of, of, I'm just giving it as an example, we're having dozens of those cases, but it's not like birthright that we're offering to every OLE that will, every visitor will come. Although I have to say that all researches show that that's the most important part of, of affecting your identity. When you come into Israel and any, anyone who listens to me now know that from his experience, no, there is no replacement for the experience of standing on Friday in the, the hotel and first time to hear and to see how it looks like or standing in the, the, the tfirah, the horn in, the, in Yom Atzmaut, Yom Zikaron. There are a lot of many experiences that I, I remember that those moments were hard for me when I was shaliach that you're not feeling it, the atmosphere of the holidays or, uh, or memorial days or whatever, and it doesn't care what, what, what the day, but when you come into Israel, it's, it's all around you. 
Uh, and it's starting also for the most rational people to start to think about where I'm coming from, where I'm going to, what I want to achieve in my life. Those big questions that helping to, uh, to create your identity. Uh, and that's something. So unfortunately, we're not doing too much. We're doing a lot of things, but we're not uh, doing it without having any kind of fund for people uh, to come. But, uh, but rather than that, we're involved in a lot of delegations. Um, so I do want to move back a little bit. Move back. We're move back a little bit um, because we brought up and I brought up uh, the World Zionist Congress. And for people that don't know, you certainly mentioned this in the beginning, um, the World Zionist Organization was kind of born out of the very first World Zionist Congress. Can you first just tell us a little bit about what Congress is and what is the role of Congress now, today? Okay, so as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, every fifth year you're having a Zionist Congress which those 208 people would gather in 1897, is still happening. Every, every delegate is supposed to represent a community, congregation, stream. And what's amazing about it, that the only gatherness of the Jewish people that you're having, everyone, everyone in Jewish world, everyone, all, all groups, Hadassah, Vitzo, Naamat, everyone, it's, it's amazing. But think about it, that you're going to a room and you see a 750 people which basically representing all the Jewish communities, not all, but most of the Jewish communities, and of, for sure, all the big Jewish communities in the world. Uh, out of those 750, you'll be surprised that 140 of them, more than 140 of them are allocated for America, which are basically 140 people that come in from different synagogues, that come in from different organizations, JCCs, lay leaders of community who are representing. The idea is to gather all of them for three, three, three days in Jerusalem. Uh, and basically, as I said before, if, if my uh, boss, the chairman of the WZO is the, uh, the, is the prime minister of the Jewish government, here, this is the government. This is the biggest assembly of the, uh, of the Jewish people, which gave, basically are dealing with the policy of the Jewish people, dealing with big questions about uh, assimilation, about anti-Semitism, about the needs of the communities, about the challenges of the communities. Uh, and just recently, in recent October, there was a, the, the last Zionist Congress, which was the 38th number Zionist Congress. I want to ask you, Mayra, how was your experience there? So I can share with people, uh, as, I'm, as I'm talking about it, that I was privileged to be a delegate on behalf of the Zionist Council, which is a part of the uh, WZO. Uh, and I was a delegate for them um, at the Congress. And um, I, I didn't know 100% what to expect going into it. And, and we should discuss the fact that uh, while normally the Congress is held in person and, and in Jerusalem with all these hundreds and hundreds of people coming together uh, because of COVID, um, this was the first time ever <laughs> in 38 Congresses that uh, it took place virtually. And uh, I know when I was originally given the opportunity to be a delegate, we didn't know that it was going to be virtual. I thought it was going to be in person and, and then it didn't turn out that way and it was virtual. And so I was part of it from my, from my house. <laughs> and, and so it was comfortable <laughs> in that way. Um, but uh, it was convenient. It was definitely convenient. I actually want to ask you I'm about it before I, no, before I jump into it more. Um, I'm curious to know from your perspective, uh, while there definitely is something to be said for doing it in person. And, and there's certainly massive value to people coming together and, and connecting with each other and, and networking and, and working together in person. I am curious if you felt that there were any specific positives to doing it virtually. My, my initial thought would be that uh, it gave people the opportunity who weren't necessarily delegates to actually be a part of it in some way, which I think uh, is incredible. So I would be very curious to know if going forward, I hope that we do go back to being in person, but if there will continue to be some virtual element, uh, and, and I'll give you a chance to respond to that, but just to go back to my own experience, um, it was 
you know, as I said, I, I grew up here, really. I, I made Aliyah from Teaneck, New Jersey, which is, you know, Jew land in, in America, for people who don't know. I was 13 years old, and so I, I've really grown up here. I've lived most of my life here in Israel. And uh, being part of the Congress was really the first time that wow. I was exposed to Jews from all over, from all over the world, from all different backgrounds and, and professions and ages. And, and yet all of them were there for one purpose. And while we might have had different ideas of, you know, certain values or, you know, outcomes that we might want and things like that, but, but the sole purpose for all these hundreds of people coming together was to talk about Israel and Zionism. And that was, in a, as somebody I consider myself to be very Zionistic and, you know, I come from a very Zionistic family and it's something that's been, you know, drilled into me my whole life, but that was incredibly powerful and inspirational um, just to be a part of that and to see what an impact uh, the Congress and, and this idea of Zionism has on <clears throat> Jews all over the world. So so that was incredible, and I'm extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to be part of it, and I hope that I get the opportunity to be part of it again, because I really enjoyed it, and I hope next time we'll be in person. Um, but so then I do want to kick it back to you to talk a little bit more about this particular Congress and, and what the challenges were to do it virtually and, and why that might have been different and some of the positives and negatives of that. I'd love to hear from you for that. Uh we had a big, big issue about uh, either having it virtually. Uh, and we were trying, from the moment to think that we realized that that uh, COVID-19 is something big. Uh, and you know, even it's a, let's say that now it's in Israel, things are fine. And, you know, me and you are going around, it's kind of, kind of routine, let's say 60, 70% of the routine back in Israel. We're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there slowly, slowly, but we're getting there. Still, uh, because we're having the word, the word word, word Zionist Congress, it's worldwide. So you cannot bring people from outside of Israel uh, with all the problems and with all, uh, all, all like the, the risks. So we were very afraid to get into that. And, but as you mentioned, that was the first time in the history that the, I mean, Elsel didn't think about it, but we were <laughs> first time in the history that we have a virtual Zionist Congress. I was very surprised that it went well. And you're asking what is the, the advantage? There is a big advantage, money. You don't need to have flights. You, need to know, you don't need to have hotels. By the way, every delegate is eligible for a third ticket and is eligible for all the accommodation, which is amazing, by the way. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I would love to spend that money, but that was an advantage. And by the way, we're still considering to have that person meeting in next year in January, but again, in order to have it, you have to make sure not that things are fine in Israel, you have to make sure that it's fine with the people that are coming to Israel. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see too many, like I mean, someone who will be responsible enough to bring people and to bring some problems. So right now, I have no doubt that the next Congress will be a, a person to person. And as you said, the most meaningful moments in the Congress, for in my perspective, rather than the amazing uh, uh, lectures and uh, everything, is the networking that's happening on the lobby of the hotel. You have to see that in, in Amir, and, he, and he, I'm sure that you will do it next time. I hope uh, so. <laughs> the, the, it's amazing because uh, the, the feeling that you're going, you're walking and you see someone from South America sitting with someone from Belgium and with someone from New Zealand, with some, and they're having something in common because what, 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 we're, we're talking about Am Israel and you're finding there that what you're having in United, it's much more than you're having there a reform rabbi and conservative rabbi and orthodox rabbi and ultra orthodox and everything the other everything everything all the that, that's what i love in the in the world Zionist organization you don't have too many organizations jewish organizations everyone having his agenda mm -hmm. here you're having one agenda that's am israel everyone is together they might argue they might have a, a, a resolutions they, they, like at the end of the day what they're doing they're bringing everything to the assembly and they're fighting it about policy but as a democracy, whoever getting the majority, we're going with that as the World Zionist Organization. So I'm proud about that. I love it. And if someone hearing me now or later on 
I'm inviting for each of you to approach to your organization to get to be a representative of them in the World Zionist Congress. It's amazing experience and you will find a lot of people you'll be surprised from a lot of things and that's ex a, a experience that cannot be replaced. It's something that you owe yourself. By the way, if you're young and you're listening to me, your chance is much more higher to get because uh, every fifth person in the Congress is a woman, every, uh, every, uh, every third, sorry, every fourth person, you have to be under 35. And we are looking for young people. We're looking for young people. We need young people. We always want to bring more young generation and not to, to keep uh, old dudes like me. <laughs> um, I, I definitely want to speak more about this particular topic and bringing in more young people. But while we're already talking about the Congress and I mentioned my experience, I was actually on uh, a committee as part of the Congress that dealt specifically with anti-Semitism. And something that you brought up as well as being one of the core challenges that you're facing right now. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the WZO is doing to address anti-Semitism in the world, particularly movements like BDS and, and just general acts of anti-Semitism we're seeing there on the rise. So can you speak more about that? Someone told me, I think last year, that if we're not going to have anti-Semitism, we're not going to have a job. So I said, I wish I'm not going to have a job, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Unfortunately, as I, as I mentioned, in the last decade, every year we're facing more incidents and more accidents and more events of anti-Semitism. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I'm having here, can you see it here? Uh, just a little bit of the top. Can you a little bit. It? It's basically a research that we have done last year about uh, anti-Semitism. There was a survey that we have done in the social media and more than 700 young adult people uh, 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 basically uh, uh, answered that survey. And it, I was amazed to see the numbers about how many people faced uh, 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 anti-Semitic uh, incident, how many people uh, uh, basically uh, is so violent with regarding that. So many, it's happening more and more. And you know, when I, when I was in, in America, I started to see some things that, uh, that I don't know if, all of us are noticing, or my, or I'm going to give you an example. I do know that the, it's very trendy now when you're going to Starbucks to have your coffee, many people using a different name, not their Jew name. Sometimes because it's easy, easy to pronounce it, but sometimes because they prefer not to identify as a Jew. So I'm just wondering and asking yourself if, if you face that. A, a, something that I was amazed also, that when you're writing in Google, uh, what is a Jew? Uh, in different countries, you're going to get a different results. And when you're doing it, for example, in China, and we have tried that, so the, the, the first thing that will come to your Google search will be the 10 anti-Semitic anti web, websites, which is amazing. Wow. Uh, uh, and the people in France that decided that the mezuzah shouldn't be outside of the house, but they started to put it in Paris uh, inside the house, the mezuzah in the, intel, uh, in, in the in, inside. Uh, so what... What is worrying me is that the number and the high of the anti-Semitism now is very close to the data that we saw in, in 1939, before World War II. It's amazing. We're reaching out to their very, very close. And when we spoke about it a few years ago, people were saying that we are crazy, but and, and everyone who's dealing with that starting to see that. We're not feeling convenient about it, but this is the reality and this is the fact. And unfortunately, we're having anti-Semitism from right which is the classical, uh, uh, classical anti-Semitism that we know from the Nazi and the, the history, unfortunately, from the history. But we're also facing uh, anti-Semitism from the left, uh, from a, a far left-wing uh, organization that sometimes hiding behind uh, civil rights. Uh, and I will say that there is a very, very narrow border between a, a legitimacy about how you can criticize that, you can criticize Israel. It's fine to criticize Israel, but sometimes it's not really criticized and, and, and it's a anti-Semitism. And that's where we are, our expertise to find those ways. It's interesting uh, that you bring that up though, before you continue, uh, there's, there's definitely a trend going on now where, where people are disassociating anti-Semitism and Israel. They're saying that anti-Zionism and anti-Israel is right. not anti-Semitism. And, and this has become a real problem, I think, um, that, that I know people are, are really trying to come out and, and stand up against, that there is no difference. That's um, right. And, 
That, yeah. That's one of the things that we have done with IRA, with the IRA definition that basically describe what is antisemitism. And I do, I do advise to all of you to Google IRA, I-H-R-A, and to Google to see, we put just recently the, 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 the best uh, uh, definition for what is antisemitism and more than 50 countries already adopted. And, and our role is also to raise awareness for those kind of things. Because when you know what is it, you know how to prevent it, you know how to deal with it, you know what to do. Uh, and we're doing conferences worldwide. I just last year, remember I was in Chile, in a, in, in a, a believe it or not, in Chile, you have the biggest population of the of a Palestinian. By the way, oh, you're always going to find that there is a high rate of anti-Semitism when you're having a, a community that, that doesn't like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're having a, a solidarity shows uh, all over the world about stopping the hate, stopping the hate of the Jews. Uh, we're trying to give to the communities as many tools as possible, even if it's security tools, just uh, to bring uh, people from security to put cameras in the synagogue, uh, to strengthen the communities, to support them. Unfortunately, Israel is very expert with dealing with crises. We see that in the corona, we see that many times in the history, and, and some of the communities are in crisis about that, about uh, dealing with anti-Semitism. Now, uh, we are trying, and um, we'll give an example that's very close to you. We are now speaking on Facebook Live. Uh, we brought to the Knesset, the uh, the chairman of I don't know if it was chairman it was the president of Facebook the president of Instagram and the president of Twitter like the the highest uh, rank of the of those three uh, social media to the Knesset for a discussion because what's going on is that it's very hard to supervise what's having have happening there the content and by the way we succeed very well with that because uh, uh, we reach out for uh, Instagram and we gave them hundreds of words that might be a, 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 a violent, that might be anti-Semitic, anti and they got it. And they uh, actually guide their people who are supervising that when they see those words, they will, they will actually drop the post. Wow. So uh, there is what to do. By the way, I do want from you, I want your involvement. Like I, I want your involvement because when you're letting us know, when you see something and you do a screenshot and you're sharing it with us, we're able to touch it, we're having a group of students that are doing monitoring of, of things in the social media. Today, by the way, this mainly the corona time, everyone is in house, everyone in their computers. That's the field, that's the field. And that's where we're having the fight. That's where we're having the challenge. And we need each eyes of you and each hand of you because we all we are all having the same, the same problem. So it's very interesting because we're talking about anti-Semitism, we're talking about the rise of anti-Semitism in the world and, and what the WZO is doing to combat that. Um, so I, I, I'm very curious to hear from you. As far as the WZO's main impact and where they're serving the, the largest number of, of Jews, would you say that the work of the WZO is more important or more impactful to diaspora Jews or is there also a role that the WZO plays in Israel with Israelis themselves? Because it seems like there's a lot of work that's focused on, on Aliyah and anti-Semitism, things like that. Those are very diaspora focused issues in many ways. So I'm curious if there is an overlap or, or some way that there, there's you know, issues of Zionism and, and things like that to be addressed in Israel as well. It's a, it's a very interesting question. When I spoke about Herzl, I spoke about how you want to create an example a, a society. So clearly, when you saw it in the Congress, 60% of the delegates are reaching out from the diaspora, 60%. And, and, and that's how we divide. 40% are coming from Israel, which means by, by definition that our focus is on, on outside of Israel. The main goal is to deal with the, their, I believe, by the way, that there are big challenges both in Israel and both outside of Israel, both in Israel and both in the, in, in, in the diaspora. Uh, so challenges are very different, very different, uh, but it appear both in both sides. So if the, for example, the simulation is a very big thing in, the, in America or outside of Israel, it's less relevant in Israel. It's, there is a simulation, but it's very, very, very low and very minor, uh, but that's what's, that's why we focus about those aspects in the diaspora, while we, we do work 
We do work with a lot of projects uh, in the Israel because we know there is ignorance in Israel society. People doesn't know about history of the of the, of the Jewish identity. Uh, people really, really, we, we need to educate people we, everywhere. People need to know where they came from. And we're gonna give an example. We're having a, a, a Brit Damim. Brit Damim is like, we're having a, a partnership with the Druze project, the big project that we are doing with them. It's in the Israeli society, but we do believe this is our part of the Hoshlichut. Uh, we're having now a department that's working with the periphery, which their focus is to go to Be'er Sheva, Ophakim, Zderot, Dimona, Yerucham, to have their Zionist project. So the focus is in outside of Israel, but definitely you're going to find that uh, uh, nearly 50% of our, uh, nearly 40% of our energy uh, resources will be allocated also to Israel. That's really interesting. Um, but I do actually want to bring this back now to the topic that we were discussing before, which was uh, the younger generation and, uh, and getting the younger generation involved. Um, and something actually you and I discussed at, a, at an earlier time, but we don't have to go into that right now. But I, I would like to get your perspective on this. Um, as opposed to the generation of certainly the founding of the state and, you know, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. I feel like that generation had a real pressing need almost for the Zionist movement, that it was it was imperative to, to the survival of the Jewish state of the Jewish people. And I think that a lot of people nowadays, especially in younger generations, they don't necessarily have that that urgency in a way to address Zionism the same way as the older generations did. And in, in many ways, they consider Israel to almost be a given. You know, we, ha we have some you know, battles here and there and, you know, some, some issues come up. But for the most part, Israel's existence, at least on that grand war scale, hasn't really been a question. You know, we've, we've been around 73 years now. And, you know, it's certainly you no know, one my age remembers the time before that. So I'm curious if that's the case and if, if younger generations are, are feeling that Israel just, it is, it is what it is, you know, we've done the real work. How can we make the, the WZO and the Zionist movement as relevant as it was then to be that relevant today again? And how can we promote that discourse among younger, younger generations and what kind of work can we do there? Let's, I think the best answer for that will be very short and sharp. Uh, Herzl, when he was starting to, to be as defining himself as Zionist, he was 35 years old. That's it. He was a lawyer. He was thinking he was a, a master or be already. He was 35 years old. He died when he was 44. He had the nine years. I think most of them was, is a young guy. I've done amazing job about a idea of bringing something from zero to 100, or I don't say 100, but zero to something much higher. So guys, we need your creativeness. We need your connection. We need your technology. We need your uh, sense of humor. We need your approach. We need all of you. Israel is a miracle. I mean, for me, the fact that I'm living in Israel and there is a place for all the Jewish people and everyone is speaking Hebrew and th there is amazing technology, I really, Think that after 73 years it's a miracle it's a miracle and and always israel you know in 1976 in antebe when there is a flight a, a airplane that's been kidnapped and you're having on that airplane people who are jews are israelis and are not jews and israel still is feeling responsible and there is arvuta that did and she's going and and with the idf soldiers and the commander soldier going and and, and releasing all of them we yeah. are a one nation but we need your smartness. We need your power. You need your energy. We need all of you. I, I said before, I mean, easiest way to help us to fight anti-Semitism. Each of you can, can do, you know, all the fight today is on the, on, the, on the computers. We need you there. We need your support. We need your warmth. I, I'm inviting you to come, to be involved, to be involved in the Congress, to be involved as activists, there is no replacement for, for young people. I remember that one of the things that was always frustrating me, that I was sitting in some boards and everyone around me was 70. But we need a young generation because only in you, you know to approach young, other young people. The, the big challenge in, in America, for example, now is that rather like something like 60% of the population are defined as unaffiliated. The unaffiliated is people that just doesn't care 
And he doesn't care. Your choice to speak with them about something is much higher than me because you're closer mm-hmm. to them physically, you're closer to the mentality than with the mentality. So we need you there. We need you with building the bridge and be involved, be active in whatever organization that you want. The, I'm, I'm proud about that the World Zionist Organization is actually give everyone the opportunity to be part of what he believe in. We're not saying to be right, be left, be radical, be conservative, be whatever you want, be yourself, but bring yourself. As long as you're a Zionist, as long as you are agree with the, with the Jerusalem program, Google Jerusalem program, see what is it, see that you agree about it and come jump to the water. So before we, we talk a little bit more about ways people can do that, I actually want to bring on a surprise guest, uh, somebody who has worked with uh, the WZO and, and on multiple projects. And I know that you are all, you know him. Uh, so I'd like to please welcome uh, Jonathan Rubin. Thank you for joining hey, us. Jonathan. Uh, how are you? Hello, hello. Good to be uh, back in touch with everyone. Shalom, shalom. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. I love your background. <laughs> from Har Herzl, yes. Jonathan, yes. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, first of all. I'm, uh, happy to see you here. Um, I know that you've done some work with the WZO, worked on some things with them. I know that you've also been part of the Congress. Can you give us a little bit of your background and share a little bit of some of your experience of working with the WZO and, and with Rafael, of course? We'd <laughs> love to hear more about that as well. Okay, so Rafael is... Uh... Rafael's an amazing guy. Actually, I was looking at a calendar, and I know Rafael for five years now. Wow. Over half a decade. Wow, so a long wow. time. And Rafael was like uh, my adopted uncle. He, uh, he took me everything. <laughs> he took care of me, uh, educated me, looked out for me. I was also a uh, young Ola, and I needed some guidance, so he helped, uh, helped me navigate the different systems. And it was really, it was really, it made my living in Israel experience very different. A bit about me, I'm from Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I lived in Israel for seven years, finished high school there, did yeshiva there, did college there, went to IDC, and met Rafal in IDC. Uh, we worked on a number of projects together. Since then, uh, I went to Columbia and New York, and now I run a startup. Um, but to go back to your questions about what I do with the WZO, uh, one of our big projects was working in the Knesset. We built a caucus to help Olim um, it's where I met Stephanie as well. Uh, to I should to clarify that Stephanie is my mother for anybody watching. <laughs> this is this is the a big happy Zionist family here. We're all connected somehow. So <laughs> please please continue. So there you go. Uh, Stephanie's watching. Hello. Um, and we that caucus in the Knesset actually became pretty large. We had thirty Anglo NGOs representing all different uh, parts of the population. Uh, we had 10 cities involved and five branches of the government. We focused mainly on English speaking Olim, um, and we focused on mental health and careers and Benoche Rood and military and had a number of legislative goals that we researched what, they, what needed to be done and worked on. Uh, we passed some uh, different legislation that helped uh, people who were newer to Israel, people who were older to Israel, people who were young, people who were seniors, people who were students, people who were retirees. So we really try to uh, help people across the spectrum. We had different websites translated so it could be more easily accessed. And we were really able to shed the light on how there could be challenges for Anglo Olim as well. Many times when people think of Olim that need help, it's usually catered more towards Russians and Ethiopians. Uh, And I don't wanna compare one one challenge to the next, but we as uh, Anglos also have our own challenges. So I really appreciate Rafael training and mentoring me and helping me uh, develop that alongside with him and other people in the WZL uh, to create a very successful caucus. Um, we worked on other projects, student projects in IDC. We brought a, a delegation of mayors to New York to meet with Jewish communities in the Northeast. Uh, we went on a few Costco trips. Uh, we, we <laughs> Don't tell the secrets. <laughs> um, we went on a few UN delegations where we met with Danny Danone um, and uh, other Israeli MKs and ambassadors. So we really did things across the spectrum, both uh, internationally and also uh, in Israel specifically. So it was nice to see that I was able to work with Rafael and the WZO family, both in my uh, Israel home and both in my US American home. 
Rafael and Yako uh, even came to Miami for a, for a weekend, for a few days, for a weekend. And we spent Shabbos together in the Florida Jewish community and we went all around South Florida meeting with the different mayors and reaching out and learning the needs of the community and seeing how we could all work together. So it was a beautiful uh, international thing. <laughs> It's actually really interesting to hear about uh, about the caucus that you were speaking about. Um, if I could just reference some of our other events, um, as I as I mentioned in my introduction, Israeli Politics Simplified and Karam House have uh, co-produced a series of events, especially in the lead up to elections. Uh, and we we were able to speak with multiple candidates from different parties across the spectrum. And one of the issues that we brought up specifically with them was Ole issues and things that uh, they and their parties would like to do to help Olim uh, and specifically Anglo Olim in Israel. And, and you know, Rafael mentioned this before about uh, helping Olim with their degrees and, and transferring them. And these are these are some of the issues that we specifically brought up. So hearing that um, that the WZO uh, and you know its various offshoots really have influence and impact there. I think is is amazing for people to hear, especially people who are already here and have made Aliyah and might be struggling in these areas or people that are considering coming to know that there really is this vast organization that is uh, specifically working to, to help people with those issues, I think is is really incredible. I can guarantee for you that there is, a, as you know, there is a big neshama in Israel. Not, mm-hmm. not there is not Chazal Khalil somewhere else, but always you're going to have find who will, would love to help you. So even though it's not like, like in your job description, many things that we are doing are not in our job description. But this is the shlichut. The shlichut is uh, to reach out to your brother and sister, which coming from somewhere else. And, you know, as our parents have done it, uh, in your case, uh, Mira, a little bit less. In my case, it's like 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Uh, and to reach out for them and to help them. And, and it, it's not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, well, I'm working in WZO. But uh, our people are willing to help. People willing to help, people willing. I, I believe people see the people coming from the diaspora as their brothers and sisters. We are, and I'm, I'm repeating that again and again. We are one nation, we are Amichad. And we have to bear that in our, our mind. We're always dealing in Israel about what is making us different. But we always, I want to work out about what's making us one nation. Um, Yonatan, I'd, I'd love to also hear from you. We talked a little bit about the Congress and I shared a little bit about my experience being a delegate and uh, the Congress in October. I know that you were a part of uh, Congress, uh, the last one I guess, <laughs> before that. Um, I'd love to hear about your experience as well and, and how you felt about that and, uh, and what you took away from that experience. So uh, it was overall, it was a good experience. Uh, I would say that I share the opinion of you that it was very, uh, a time where I got to meet many other Jews who I never would have otherwise met <clears throat> Uh, and share, you know, we might disagree politically and religiously and every other lead, but we come together and uh, we all care about the same thing. We care about Israel and it gives us a lot of common ground. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I think those who are on the younger end, I was doing it when I was uh, in college uh, or in graduate school and were able to be involved. It was, it's, was very enlightening and we got to see uh, angles or parts of the Jewish people that never would have otherwise been exposed to, both in just living as an American and in our specific community bubbles, but also in the larger Jewish picture. And uh, it definitely enlightened me on how diverse, not just on paper, but in practice, the Jewish people is and uh, how everyone celebrates their Judaism and comes together to celebrate all that we have in common. That's great. Thank you. Um, so if I had both of you on that, and I know, Yonatan, you, you got involved in the WZO when you were a little bit younger, and we spoke just recent, just now about, uh, about young people being more involved and, um, and, and being part of the WZO, how can people who aren't necessarily WZO members, people who aren't part of federations or, or organizations around the world that are specifically connected, to the WTO, how can they join in this movement in a meaningful way? Um, what, what are some other ways that they can get involved? I would say uh, send an email or a phone call to Rafa. And uh, <laughs> organize an event. Uh, I remember Rafa came, I think one of the first events we worked on together was bringing uh, my classmates from IGC and Herzliya up to Jerusalem. 
Rafael said, you need a bus, here's a bus. Get 50 of your friends, we're going to bring them to Jerusalem. Uh, this was in an international school, so most of these people, they've never been to Jerusalem. And for them, you know, their whole experience, the whole reason they chose to do school in Israel was to be part of the Jewish uh, environment, Zionist <laughs> environment that they heard about in the South American communities and the European communities. But living in uh, Herzliya, they never, they never got that experience. So Rafal said, okay, we'll pay for for a bus, we'll pay for a tour guide. And uh, we gave them a great, uh, anyone who wanted to come, it was free. And uh, we showed them around, we brought them to the Kotel, we brought them to a few other historic uh, places. And uh, everyone got involved and many people were involved in later events that we did as well, so. Rafal, do you have anything to add to that? With, uh, I, I do believe that uh, those moments are, are basically planting the seeds in the people's hearts. Uh, it might affect someone when he's uh, standing in front of the wall, the hotel, and might, uh, uh, we are dealing with a lot of ignorance. And when people are coming and having their experience, they might change their perspective. It might change their ideas. It might change them as a, a better people who are speaking for Israel. We want people for Israel, pro Israel. Uh, that will know the reality, that will know what's going on the ground and not just going to make their decision from what they see in the media, which is sometimes, as you know, unfortunately, is a little bit biased uh, here or there, uh, also in Israel. So we are trying to bring the people to the ground and they will make their decision. By the way, we're not telling them what to think, but we are trying to bring them and they will make their thing. But because I do believe that most of the people who live in Israel love Israel and things good about Israel, and they might make their decisions that right now they decide not to live in Israel, but we want that they will be our friends. And it's fine, everyone can live wherever you want, but it's, it's different if you are making your decision to live uh, somewhere in Belgium uh, and you're not, uh, your kids never gonna come here, or if you're gonna grow up them with the Jewish identity, because at the end of the day, what kept us as a nation was that we kept the Torah and Israel, the tradition and some, some connection. Somewhere, and we pray for Israel. So I think Israel is the stick between all of us. It's like the, the sorry, not stick, the glue between all of us. It's the glue that's putting us together as one nation. Although East and West, Mizrahim, Sfaradim, all conflicts and all uh, the 12 tribes, but still that was putting a glue between those 12 tribes to bring them to Israel, to show them the beautiful side of Israel. And there is a lot of beautiful sides of Israel. There are some, some you know, challenges, of course. We're not saying that everything here is, is cool and easy and, and smooth. Uh, that's it. So that's what we're doing in the WZO. Uh, by the way, uh, yeah, you're not a know, know me, so we know I will always suggest that anyone would come here, but we're more than welcome to give a call, to come to me, to come to a tour in Hallel, to come to tour in Jerusalem. We are here to host you. We are here to serve you. We are here to help you. And that's our shlichut. Um, so are there, are there any particular projects or, or opportunities that you can share with us that people can get involved in if they want to? There is many, 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 many projects. As I said, our main focus is about uh, activities in the diaspora, which means that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna reach out for the shaliach, you might be involved in your community. When you come into Israel, I, you know what I'm challenging you. If you come into Israel, you're gonna come in. I will find you a project. There is no and there is no doubt about. We're looking always for interns. We're looking for people who're gonna come and they will help us with the monitoring of the anti-Semitism. We're talking about people who will be involved today. Unfortunately, it's a bit less because the, because the COVID. About uh, we're having a list of variety of delegations that we're involved with. Uh, we are talking about. Uh, different projects that we want to be involved. Jonathan was involved a little bit. He didn't mention that uh, the, the quiz of the Zionism, Zionism quiz, something that we try to develop uh, is working very, very well in Israel. It was a bit harder to, to bring it uh, for uh, Jewish communities outside. Uh, the idea of having like, like a Bible context that you have, so you're having a, a context uh, about uh, Zionism. Uh, you remember that I said before, you're young, you're creative. Sometimes the ideas of what we need to develop is in your mind. Uh, we are, uh, I'm already 20 years in those uh, organizations. And so I need your young thoughts, fresh thoughts, ideas. We're open mind for that. So I think we're, we're almost ready to, uh, to close down. But before, before we sign off here, 
Uh, we just celebrated Israel's 73rd Independence Day. And we talked about how, you know, Herzl unfortunately didn't get to actually see the, the birth of the modern state of Israel. Um, but certainly his vision was a huge part of, of making it happen. And, um, and there's no question that without him, Israel wouldn't be where it is. Um, and part of, the, we, we're having this discussion really in honor of Yom Atzimut. So before we close out, uh, is there anything that you can share with us either from, you know, what Herzl's impressions might be of the current state to, to brachot for, for the year coming and the years coming? Any final thoughts that you can leave us with in honor of yes, I would love to, to actually bring to my mind the final thoughts. This is the first time I got my new... I like, there is another position that add to me as a, a Harrelsel director. And I was in the last two months a lot in Harrelsel. You know, Harrelsel is like where you're having all the previous prime minister that buried there, of course, Herzl, Jabotinsky. Uh, uh, and I had the first year, if it, because I'm, I'm a Kohen, I'm usually not going to cemetery. And this, the, the destiny took me now for working in a, in a, in a somewhere, which is a, a cemetery. Uh, and I had, the, I, at the beginning, I wasn't very happy about it. And when I started to work, I realized how much it's amazing. This year, you, start, you talk about Independence Day. You're talking about, first of all, about the Memorial Day. Yom Zikaron, the Memorial Day in Israel, I'm sure you understand that you remember that when you're from your experience. It's very, very different. You know, someone asked me, how come that in America, it's day that everyone going to the mall and there is a big shopping things. And, and in, in Israel, it's very, very, very different. Uh, uh, and I had the privilege this year to be on the on Har Herzl, on the cemetery day, to have all the ceremonies with. I saw the prime minister three or four times, and the president was there, and all the ministers. It was such a more amazing moments about how we appreciate those people who gave their life for that country, and how much so much appreciation about the things that we had such a, a sweet, happy Independence Day this year. For some reason, something happened to my mind, and it's a circle that can close only in Israel. That it's, it's very strange that in the morning you are going to the, the cemetery and everything, and you see nearly four thousand flags that been put about every every grave of the soldier, and every 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 grave have a chair beside him and a mom and, and a mom that's sitting beside him, and everyone who is living like I mean a hard moment, and at the end you see happiness. That I mean, thanks to them, this is the uniqueness of Israel. And that's something that's hard to explain. Only when you're here, you are facing that. And I saw that this year in my eyes. Uh, it really strengthened me this year. It really strengthened me that this is the place for the Jewish people. So with those, those words, <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Rafael, for, for being with us for this whole Thank uh, you, talk. Mira. I mean, it was extremely enlightening and, and interesting and fun for me. And, um, and thank you, Yonatan, for joining in and sharing a little bit about your experience working with Rafael specifically and with the WZO. Um, it's always interesting to hear from, uh, from somebody who's lived it and who's, who's lived that experience. So thank you for, for sharing with the, that with us as well. Um, and thank you thank you everybody for tuning in be sure to follow the Karim House and Israeli Politics Simplified pages on Facebook to hear more about upcoming events and talks thank you and good night <laughs>